Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Stories Out of Time and Space. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly. As always, I'm here with my road warrior, Julian Darius. <laughs> Julian, how are you doing? You okay? I'm doing fine. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Mad Max. How about you? Yes, I'm very excited. Yes. Uh, we pedal to, me- pedal to metal and burn some rubber on those wasteland roads. We're back for season five. We had our Black Mirror interlude. And just to highlight, that what has been given the go-ahead for a new season. Whether mm-hmm. we come back for it, we we will discuss. But uh, I think we've had enough Black Mirror for now. At least, at least I have. But now we are heading out into the apocalypse with season five. Season five's theme is going to be apocalypse, post-apocalypse. Apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> Good <Going> metal. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most the, metal season. Oh, that's it. The yeah. out of time. <laughs> the apocalypse. Uh, yeah, we're going to be doing the uh, post-apocalypse movies, um, and we are starting that with possibly, I would suggest, probably the most famous post-apocalypse franchise. Uh, We are going to be doing the Mad Max saga leading into um, Furiosa uh, and discussing the new new, new Mad Max Maxless film, but starring (laughs) Furiosa uh, and Atella Joy. So looking forward to getting through that. But we are going to start... Right at the beginning, and well, we'll lead. Maybe at the end of the show, we'll lead in. We'll give a few, some few samples of the films that will be coming up as well in season five. But for now, we are hitting those Australian outback roads, and we're going to be talking Mad Max, nineteen seventy nine. Um, so to give a, 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 a small plot synopsis, I think really, um, in a well, this is a, a this isn't kind of like a post apocalyptic world yet. This is a sort of like a world in decline. Um, our Australia, um, resources are low uh, and police enforcement is on the wane, apart from this elite police force on the roads, uh, of which Max is a part of. Um, Max, Max, Max Rodadensky, Rodan- I can't remember what his name is. Um, Rotansky, yeah. yeah. Um, and they spend their time fighting uh, roving uh, bike gangs on the streets as they sort of go around. Um, this eventually ends up sort of hurting one of Max's uh, colleagues and friends. And so after all this, he quits the force. And so they go around with his family, uh, his wife and, daughter, and child. Um, and in doing so, during one of these, these events, one such gang kills his wife and child and Max goes on a revenge filled rampage to kill off this gang including their leader Toe Cutter um, his best his best sort of his side Johnny the Boy and everybody else um, this stars no one you've heard of apart from Mel Gibson <laughs> uh, I would say unless you're sort of listening to us in Australia in which case you know thank you for listening um but yeah, what will it start? Off? What are your thoughts then, Julian? Your overall thoughts on the the first, the original nineteen seventy nine Mad Max? Um, well, you know, you said it's a sort of revenge film. Um, I mean, I think this is an a fine film, but not great. It has certain traits that I yeah. associate with the later Mad Max films, but it's kind of not there yet. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, it is a low-budget Australian movie, um, and that's fine. Um, I think that it is a solid, just kind of, sort of post-apocalyptic societies falling apart revenge, you know, movie. But it starts with a revenge. The revenge is the criminal's revenge. Um, And then turns in very late in the film to, you know, his revenge for losing his his wife and... uh, or his girlfriend, I'm not really sure, um, and uh, and child, adopted yeah. child. 
It, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I say one of the things I noticed about this is like I say it's it's got that sense of of later sort of George Miller mad like this that some of the craziness is there in some of the stunts, especially in this opening chase. Um, it, it it's all a little bit Keystone Cops to begin with they're supposed to be like this is clearly not like a trained police force this is just what's left over and some of the stunts and stuff are great and funny and, and that, but they're kind of useless as police <laughs> that's what it boils down to and max seems like max and fifi who's his boss kind of seem like the only two that are actually any good at this <laughs> um the others are a little well, bit and, and the like weaponier guy who dies you know yes uh, goose goose yeah Straight out of Top Gun. Mm. Well, before Top Gun, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a prequel to this. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. Um, the ta the Mad Max Top Gun uh, crossover you didn't know you wanted. Um, but the other thing I noticed about it, this feels very much like a Western. Yeah. Uh, that with, was cars. Like, with cars. With right. cars, Instead yeah. of horses or something. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, you said they kill... Um, at the beginning, Ghost uh, Knight Rider is the is the guy who is the sort of is this escape. He's escaped. He's on the run, and they're chasing him down. And he's got this girl with him, and this is whole big chase. And they're all sort of chasing him down. And you get the the hero introduction of Max as like keeps cutting back to him, and he's putting his shades on and his jacket on and his helmet or whatever he's been on. And he's getting in, into his car. And you think he's going to stop them? Nope. <laughs> He kind of just runs him off the road a little, but like yeah. he doesn't do anything overly heroic or over sort of, you know, it doesn't achieve a great deal. Um, but the death of Knight Rider, like his body is taken and he it gets sent to this small town where I assume maybe he's from or whatever, or has been asked to be sent there. And Toe Cutter and his gang ride in. And they sort of, and, but I was, I was thinking there's, there's a moment where they're all sort of, they, they go to a train station. And I'm jumping around a bit though, but I want to say, but there goes this train station, and and I mm -hmm. did feel like, oh, this is leaning into like all those um, once upon a time in the West, yeah. you know, um, there's John Ford films. I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to have those sort of silhouettes with his people just stood on a platform, and it does that. It literally does that. So I was like, oh, okay, this is the old West. This is a Western, and this is the gang, and you know, does that, and it is 100. percent That's exactly what mm -hmm. it is. But it mm -hmm. for me, it works in that way. Yeah, I mean, I I would say like everything that I like about this movie is sort of the touches that suggest where the franchise is going to go, but that would not be obvious if this were the only movie we had. Mm. Um, so for example, like I mean, I am not charmed by you know the the racing stuff, you know the the cars, you know. Um, guys falling off their motorcycles with obvious cords attached. I mean, you know, that's fine. You know, some of that footage is, is you know, clearly you use stuntmen, you know, and, and it's impressive for your budget, but it's mm. it's not really amazing. And like you say, that that opening, they make such a big deal out of him, and then he doesn't really do that much. No. But the stuff that I really dig is like, you know, obviously the revenge plot is kind of perfunctory, but, you know, stuff that I really dig. I love the police station. <laughs> like, the police mm. station is, like, amazing. They've got, like, you know, a baby uh, doll tacked to a door, you know, for no known reason. <laughs> like, like, you know, that and that um, the guy who leads the police is, like, you know, he's in an outfit. Everybody's got, like, weird names and stuff. And they're just kind of, like, eccentric characters, very much like later Mad Max films will do. Um you know, here they want to give each of those gang members their own name and, you know, sort of like a little bit of a design. By later installments, they won't even bother with a name. You know, <laughs> like, it's just like this sort of like streamlined, simplified plot element. That's kind of here. Yes. But if this were all you had, you just think this was a kind of minimal, you know, film. So I like the sort of like lived in feel of the sets uh you know these kind of like classic miller-esque like mm. touches of like the um you know that uh 
you know, that baby doll and, you know, the, you know, there are all these sort of things that you just think, remember, you know, like make this space your own. Somebody has told these actors or these, you know, set designers, like make this space your own. And, you know, so the eccentric characters, the eccentric costumes, the, you know, that kind of embrace of weirdness and eccentricity and crazy characters all that stuff is sort of here but it's all very muted compared to all the other films um yes but it, it does give it, it is notable it is noticeable in this and you and if this were all we had we just say like yeah it's a it's a tolerable revenge film you know i i, I can't imagine that anyone saw this and thought you know let's make a star out of mel gibson um you know, but this would be just a, a little asterisk with with those elements that were interesting. Mm. No, I, I know what you're saying. Um, it's almost like they're trying to make it um, digestible, you know, consumable. They're like, look, we want to go all out on this craziness, but we know we can't sell. We haven't got the clout to sell the full craziness we want to do, so we're going to have to pull back. And for example, I think, you know, to sort of uh, to make a point of what you're saying, so you say about the costumes. So you do have like you know the the cop costumes are very sort of typical, the leathers and all this stuff. Look, they look for a low budget, looks good. And even the biker gang, you know, they've gone out. Their costumes are great. I think that you know there's some details and stuff. There's oddities. There's weird stuff in some of the helmets and in the bikes, but also in the costumes. Some of the things they're wearing, the little oddities, and you think, okay, cool. This is this is weird, and it's kind of like the world is spiraling. But then when Max leaves the forks and they go on like a holiday road trip, it's like he's wearing khakis and a striped shirt, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, this is just like you've left the weirdness behind. Like this is a very, you know, beyond. You're trying to say that beyond the um um the weirdness of being the police and what's out there on the road, like everything else is like relatively normal. And that feels so out of place. When you see him at the, uh, yeah. the, the there's a garage where they've got a flat tire, but they, you know, they've changed it, but they want to like get the spare fixed. And he steps out in like this, <laughs> this smart shirt and mm-hmm. khakis. I'm like, this feels odder than anything else in this film. Yes. And it's kind of like tucked in, yes. right? It's like, yeah. you know, it's hard to imagine. Thanks. Mm. Tucking in a dress shirt, you know? yeah. Like, it just feel, it yeah. feels like a, it, like a concession that's been made. Um, so you know, but I think they, they I can see one because I think they want to sort of um, have him be the normal one that's being pulled back mm-hmm. in. Like this is his attempt at have a, to having a normal life, um, and I think you could have explored that better. But yeah, I, I agree. When when it goes like when the um, when it is odd, when this film is left to be odd. I love some of the, the flourishes it has, and not just yeah. the car stuff. Like when the gang, when the biker gang turn up in that small town, and they get off, and the two of the two of the um, the bikers just start sort of they grab each other and just start dancing like ballroom dancing across the road, and then later on when uh, Max's wife is being stalked by one of them, two are sort of stalking her. One's pretending to be a cat on the roof of yes. the store. And I'm like, I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's almost like he's in a crucifixion position. Yeah. Like, you know, no, I, I mean, that's exactly the kind of stuff that it's like, oh, there's the George Miller stuff that yeah. we're going to see in later sequels. I'm not sure why there's this abandoned building next to the uh, ants farm. <laughs> um, Like, you know, it's very bizarre It's a yeah. big problem, but it's those elements that are just sort of idiosyncratic and weird. And, you know, they really stick out and are great. Um, No, I agree. You know, if if this is all we had, we think those, that's like a foreshadowing Robocop and it's kind of like Mm -hmm. weird, crazy criminals. We like, you know, those elements are there, but they're really stuck in a very conventional revenge story. Yeah. One of the things, um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll come back to it. There's a point I want to make, actually, but I will come back to it very sh- in, in a moment because what you're saying, there's almost like a culture. This is the thing I think about this film. Like you said, so um, what I've watched them, I mean, you know, we're going to go through all of them. We're going to do Mad Max, Road Warrior, Thunderdome, and um, Fury Road, and then get to Furiosa. All my life, I've been like, yeah, these are like, it's basically almost like, to me, it was almost like an anthology film. 
an anthology film franchise where George Miller was like, yeah, same character, but like now I want to do this crazy. Like now I've got money, so I'm going to do this. Or now I've got a truck, so I'm going to do this. Like it always felt like kind of dis- disconnected. Uh, but this time I was I was determined because, okay, there's got to have been connective tissue to this. Um, Because there's a whole pro. We'll get to the when we get to Road Warrior. There's a whole preamble about the world collapsing and stuff. And I was like, yeah, but the first one was meant to be called post apocalypse. So what's what's the point? So why you know is that meant to be pre? One of the things about this world is uh, when the writer of this was writing it, there was this there was trouble in the Persian Gulf. There was you know there was real concern that the Persian. I think it's called. There's an oil crisis going on. Mm -hmm. And apparently, one of the questions was, well, what happens if they blew each other up? And the oil just stopped overnight. And they were like, oh, well, the world wouldn't stop instantly. Mm-hmm. But but outer parts of the world would start to decline very quickly. So this is less a post-apocalypse. And this is a kind of an acknowledgement that like the world, you know, we, we have like post-nuclear apocalypse where the world is like, it's gone to shit instantly. Mm-hmm. But, but th- this film was trying to acknowledge that, like, no, this isn't. This is almost like an incremental collapse, and that's obviously what like, the police station is. Like, you know, there was a police station. There's still a court system. Yeah, that that really surprised me. Yeah, they're like, there's there. It seems like your hands are tied. You've got to let him go. He's got rights. It's like, oh, really? I guess. Yeah, but there's no know, like, police, the police force. But like the Australian government has either completely collapsed or you know, the police have been replaced by these local, you know, this and local that's what it is. police force. So in but the they're back... still like, we're going to respect these rights, right? Like they're they're trying yeah. to hold up civilization. So when you when you read when I read and this, you know, I'm not sure if this is the whole truth. Cause I read this on the internet, so take it for what it's worth. But this is a fan wiki kind of site, so I'm taking some of the notes. And I, I tried multiple sources. This is a volunteer police force. That's what it's supposed to be. Mm. This is the people that are sort of chosen to do this, but aren't sort of supported. And the government, whilst not collapsed, are mostly distracted by the fact that they can't sustain the things in the cities. So those mm-hmm. outlier places in the outback or close to the outback are just forgotten. This has become like literally the Wild West. This is this is this is fend for yourselves. And it it didn't it never says what city or urban place they have gone to to try and take them to court. But that's mm-hmm. like, as you said, that's like the the remnants of the court system, and uh, it's really funny when the, the little squeaky guy is going like, "The courts will hear about this. The courts will hear about this," and everyone's like, "Yeah, whatever." Like, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. Um, but you're right; they're trying to sort of cling to civilization, um, and but Max and this police force are like they're like one step away, and there's a there's a moment that when um. Max has a conversation with Fifi. And by the way, I love Fifi. It's, it's basically both as a mm-hmm. character name, but also as an actor and look. Just this huge, bald guy with a big moustache who walk, wears like a, a cravat tie and just walks around like walking like his pants. And yeah. uh, is otherwise shirtless. No, I yeah. agree. Like he, as soon as he shows up, like he's got character presence. Yeah. You know, he's designed. You're like, oh, Here's the Mad Max character. Yeah, know? yeah, exactly. He's like, the he's... future of the franchise. Yeah, it, he's brilliant. Um, but they have a conversation when Max quits, and he says, "Oh, this again." Like you know, Max has clearly been pushed, and he says, "No, this is it. I'm done." There's no like, I'm handing in my notice, and I work my notice, and two weeks or whatever. Mm. It's like, no, I'm I'm gone. This was a volunteer service, and I'm gone. But when Max says why, it's the stuff he's seeing. He's like, "I'm beginning to enjoy this." Mm-hmm. I'm being pulled into the craziness, and it, I can't be like I've got to cling to some, like some level of of humanity, some level of sort of civilization. And so, although we have sort of like joked at him wearing these khaki trousers and this shirt, I almost think like that's his attempt to be like, well, this is what would have happened in the normal world. This is these are the last things I've got left from that world and it's just kind of trying to do it um however i would say in the same in a scene beforehand before he goes to work they have a picture they have a, a scene of his child playing with his gun so you mm-hmm. know it's he's not completely normal um yeah but yeah oh yeah you know the the, the craziness is is the madness let's say is creeping into this world the world is going mad 
And I, I really do quite like that. I, I think that it should be better explained or underlined. I agree. Um, agree. You know, like they should, you know, it's amazing. A line of dialogue, like, you know, look, this is a volunteer force. You know what it's like, out, you know, like mm. the government doesn't care about us anymore. You know, a couple of lines, even in the middle of the movie, I don't need that all at the beginning, um, would do a great job here. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but I do quite like the idea of sort of like, you know, a slow apocalypse, right? Yes. Sort of, you know, that does seem a lot more realistic and a lot more interesting than there came a day where it all ended. Da -da 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 -da. Judgment day. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And that, <laughs> and that's, that's where I'm, I like this. Cause one of the things we've always said, you know, we've watched films or TV shows and we, when we've reviewed them and discussed them and it focuses on North America or at least, you know, the United States of America, or even like Los Angeles or New York, you know, and we've said, well, what's happening in the rest of the world? Like, how is the rest of the world? You know, because we do know that, like, things that happen in the American economy have a knock-on effect to the rest of the world. But, like, so how is that? What are they like? Yeah. This is, this We're is almost Americans. like... We just forget there is a rest of the yeah. world. <laughs> but this film sort of answers that question where they're like, oh, America's really suffering right now because of this oil crisis. This is the knock-on effect to Australia. Like, this yeah. isn't the main story. There's a whole other story going on in the United States that we're not privy to don't care about. That's not this story, but because of that collapse that's happening globally, mm -hmm. this is this, this is the state of this one part of Australia. And I, I do find that more interesting as a concept. Yeah. It's sort of, you know, we like sort of small stories, side mm. stories, you know, and, and I think that that's a, that's a very interesting approach. I, you know, I, I like that approach. You know, I also like the sort of implication that, um, you know, we're very relied on this one substance of oil. And, you know, think about what happens if that stops tomorrow, right? Mm. But again, that's not really in this film. That's really more in the next film. Um, this film is kind of like if all you had were this film, you would say it's really ambiguous yeah. what's going on, you know certain parts like clearly society is falling apart you you would almost wonder like has some sort of like fascistic element taken over you know in this this area that has replaced the police force but they don't really have the resources yet to you know like it could be a local rebellion you know you're i mean it's so ambiguous mm. um and i think uh, you know more in that direction would make this a much better movie. A lot of what we're admiring about this and its place in the franchise is stuff that is not later. there in this first one. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the thing. I do like this film. I, I like it has ideas. That's the thing. Like it's, you know, it's trying for and a very, very low budget. I mean, this is, hmm. yeah, you know, um, as we go through, I will hold, I'm going to hold this in my head because, and I'm going to present it now, actually. Um, this has a, this has a parallel trilogy in in my head. In fact, it has a parallel yeah parallel franchise. Mad Max matches Evil Dead. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is how I see it. Like you know, there's a you know um, there's a, a low budget, you know, really cobbled together opening film. It does surprisingly well. You know, hits the market in, in international in international markets when it was supposed not really supposed to. So some more money is given, and they do a much more ambitious, but still low budget follow up mm -hmm. sequel. That they they go oh, all right. Well, they like that. We'll go, we'll lean into the crazy, and then they do an off the wall third film when you're like, okay, they've really gone full out nuts, and then they have a reboot. Um, so I'm I'm just going to parallel that as we go through this. I think this this franchise mirrors Evil Dead, and that's yeah. not a bad thing. Um, no, I mean I think I think one of the one of the differences for me is that I mean I watched the the Evil Dead movies as a kid and you know yep. enjoyed the you know the sort of low budget stuff. I think they get worse the more money you spend on them, and <laughs> Mad Max gets better the more money you spend yes. on it. But you know. That's my one caveat. But yeah. You're right. I mean, you know, one thing that that, you know, occurs to me while we're sort of digressing a little bit on the franchise is. Um, 
what an awesome franchise Mad Max is. Mm. And I think it's a it, it is amazing to me how much I love the Mad Max films. You know, I am a big fan of like I love franchises, I love shared universes, I love, you know, expansive histories and all of this. Um I am always a fan of sort of like the underdog. I'm always a fan of like, you know, I want Alien, I want Predator, mm. I want these kinds of like smaller franchises to be done smart and better and all of this. Um and you know, Mad Max is a amazing franchise i mean i think its hit rate for me is stunning i think this is kind of like the low budget sort of like proof of concept to me that sort of isn't quite there yet yeah and by itself would be just a you know an okay you know australian revenge movie yeah um no i think that's fair i think yeah it works it's one of those things. I agree. I think I think you know. I love the Mad Max franchise. I do think they sort of the more they've got it, the more wacky George Miller has got. Um, but again, like you said, one of the things I was going to mention is that this film is is, is kind of neutered as well because when Max takes it, he's called Mad Max, and so you're expecting like you know fury or something. But when he takes his revenge, it's it's not. He does it, but again, I think they've almost spent their money. So they're like, okay, we're gonna this is how he's gonna get his revenge. He's kind of <laughs> quick. And then the final person that he kills, he sort of blows up on, you know, sort of a little bit off screen and stuff. Um it's all fine, well, it's all good, but even even his fa- his family, right? His girlfriend yeah. and, and her son, I mean, are killed off screen and you and he runs to the bodies and it's a long shot. So like, you know. Clearly, they're like we did not have the budget for ketchup. You know, like, yeah. Well, it's when um, goose when goose gets blown yeah. up, like, goose catches fire, and they're in uh-huh. hospital, and they've got this like ne- slight neon glow under a blanket, and then Max goes in, and they're like, you know, he even says to him, he says, you know, uh, Fifi says, like, you know, be careful, son, you know, and then he, he goes, but you know, he, he sort of barges his way in, pulls back the blanket. You see him pulling back the blanket, and it just cuts to Max's reaction. And there's like a fate, like a woo 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 well, look, and he first, comes out. First, a, a hand falls out, That's and not a that hand bad. is charred. Yeah. And you're like, okay. In retrospect, it's like we we you know how much budget do we have? Well, we can do one hand. <laughs> you know, like, you know, okay, so his hand falls out from underneath the 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 blanket, and then he's and I'm thinking like, oh, he's gonna not pull back the blanket, right? Because that's all you can afford. And then he pulls back the blanket, and as you say, it's all done in close up of like my I didn't big wide well eyes enough. and gasping. But, but mm. yeah, it works well enough. But but as you see more and more of these instances, it just becomes painfully obvious they could not afford it. Yeah, I mean it's fine. I appreciate that they, um, you know, they want to sort of have that. And mm-hmm. you said one of the things you said is, um, and I think this is a. Uh, a good example of this. This is not the star making vehicle of, of Mel Gibson that, you know, I think sometimes it, it, people credit it as. I think Road Warrior is much more that film because he's sort of fine in this, but because I think he's so young, mm-hmm. you know, he's supposed to have come across as like, oh, he's been on the, on the roads too long. And I'm like, what, 18 months? Like, how long has this guy been a cop? Like, he's not that old. Like, you know, he looks very <laughs> yeah. young. Um, he graduated high school like three years ago. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that's not the case. He's probably older than that, but like you, you know, you get my point that um, well, no, he was born in '56, so '76, you know, so '76. No, there's no. He was 23 Early when this 20, was made. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're right. Like he's he can't be like, oh, I'm a grizzled, you know, cop of the road. You go, no, you, you're not. You're you're too young. Um. And he looks fresh faced, and I think that's the problem. Yep. You know, he looks too fresh faced to be sort of like this is starting to affect me. I'm going, ah, oh, you know, you need someone a little bit older. Um, and also his acting is a little shaky at times. Like that moment when he does mm-hmm. come out and he says, like, you know, that's not goose in there. And he's, oh, I'm going like, okay, <laughs> take <laughs> right, that's good. I feel I'm feeling it. Can we just do that one more time? Um, but you know, tr- you know, I don't know something, something. Um, Tone it down a little. Yeah, just sort of feel it internally. Like you know, you're frustrated. You're yeah. you know, you're heartbroken. Something. Um, 
it, yeah, so it does. It feels it's, it's this isn't the star making vehicle. Like he's he's fine, but it was this is he's not an outstanding. The person that is, and I can't stop watching, is, and I'm so glad he's going to come back in the franchise. Uh, Hugh Keys Burn as Toe Cutter. Because mm. mm-hmm. he'll come back. He plays a Morton Joe in um, mm. Fury Road. Um, he is like they're like right. You're a cult leader and a leader of this gang. Do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Well, and it's that it's eccentricity that yeah. uh, we're know, talking it, about. It so characterizes you know mm. what we love about this franchise, and um, yeah, no, I mean it's good. I, I I just wonder, like you're right. I just wonder, like if we had this by itself we would say basically like they're a you know they're basically like the droogs from clockwork orange or something you know like an odd gang you know with its own you know outfits and whatever Mm. um it would be a lot less notable i sort of you know find myself watching this and basically everything i admire are like the germs of what's, what's going later. to be there in later films but they're kind of not quite here yet no i know, I know what you're saying um i will say that, yeah, yes and no i still find toe cutter like mm. he was still stand he still stands out to me like this moments like he was a stage actor and so like everything's very stagey but like it works um but the moment that he's on the 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 this feels a little bit like again, you know, we talk. Uh, well, we haven't got, we haven't reached it yet. But like in Kurosawa's uh, Yojimbo, when um, um, Mufuni's character reaches the sort of the town, there's a guy there who's like the town crier and stuff, or the town he rings the bell, but he's also the guard, and he's got like multiple jobs in the town, and he's like, oh wait a minute, and he'll do this other job. There's the same here where they meet this guy who's just stood out, stood outside this this store. And they're like, we need to get to the train station. We need to talk to the station guard. And the guy's like, okay, mm. wait a second. And the next time you see him, he's got a clipboard and a hat on. And he's like, well, I'm the station guard as well in this place. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I like those little details that are sort of funny. But it's the moment that when they got the, they reach the coffin and he sort of, he makes a comment and Toka to sort of turns on him and he isn't touching him, but he's got like his hands resting on his face. And he gives him this sort of little monologue and he's got the boy sort of stood behind him. Um, there's just there's moments like that throughout where I'm just like you're sort of I can believe I understand why I know what you're saying about them like the with the droogs and others but like this guy like I can understand that he why he feels like a cult leader mm. like I buy him as the leader of this gang and there's a, there's a moment they, they tell him to go back and get uh, uh, I forget which which one of the characters has, has stayed behind it's in, in, it's the one that gets arrested. Um, and he tells he, he tells uh, Johnny the boy to go back and do it. And he's like, "You're not doing it for them, you're doing it for me." And it's that real sort of you know manipulation of but like leadership of like cult leadership. I just find him really entertaining to watch. Like he's like you said, there's there's, there's clearly more experienced actors like um, this Hugh Keys Burn playing Toe Cutter, and uh, I'm going to call them out because they're great, and and Roger Ward playing Fifi. Mm. But I'm like, mm-hmm. oh. You you've got much more screen presence than Mel Gibson right now, and you're making this film for me. Like you are, f- you know, you know what you're doing. You're fun, you know. That's that's well, the I, film for me. I agree. Fifi steals the show. I sort of feel like Toe Cutter, not as much. I mean, I I sort of feel like he's fine, but yeah. even in that scene with the uh, at, at the train, you know, where he puts his hands on the guy's, you know face and you know it's kind of like okay that's weird he's sort of intimidating but gratuitous like you know the sort of like take your hat off and he says you know anything you you say and he says that's a that's a wonderful philosophy you know i do like that line and Mm -hmm. i like how he plays that up um but it just feels like a restrained version of um again like kind of you know like robocop bad guys and you know yeah you know it's like yeah, I see what you're going for here. You're going for it. Good on you for doing it. But it, it's sort of like not entirely there yet for me. Like, I don't really, you know, it's just a guy cowering in front of a slightly weird, you know, mm. David Lynchian, you know, uh, Blue Velvet, you know, character or something. 
Um, I'm not trying to minimize it. I mean, no, you no, know, no. I, I do like the that some of that dialogue, but it does it does consistently come off as sort of like I'm glad what you are going for here. It's not quite there. Mm. What about um, you know we've said about sort of Mel looking too young. What about the sort of the mad bit then? Let, let's talk about that because we've gone through. You know, you've had all of. Um, you know the the bit with against the gang and all this other stuff, and then he's he's off in his car keys and his wife and the kid. There's 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 a funny bit because you say about it's an adopted kid, but um, the child is there in several scenes. It play either you know play at one point playing with Max's gun and all this other stuff mm-hmm. before he goes to work, and and then they're there, and then there's like it's it's never kind of they say they're going to the science house, but it's never clear they've actually reached there. And then there's a whole bunch of scenes of them like running through fields and doing stuff. And I'm like, wait, where's this kid? Like, where's yeah. your child gone? And then it appears at a window, like in the next scene, you're like, oh, you just left them in the car. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> well, even um, so the way the, the climax plays out, they're at the aunt's house. I do quite like this rough and tumble aunt with the with the guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She, she steals the show a little bit. Um, she's certainly more interesting than the girlfriend. Um mm. But so the girlfriend sort of like goes down to the beach and is accosted by or is scared in the forest by um, people. And it's not really clear whom she's been warned. There's a local who's weird, who who sort of reminds me of the, you know, the guy from Goonies, you know. Um, Sloth. Yeah, yeah. OK. He's like a Lenny kind of character, isn't he? Sort of, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe sort of retarded, big guy, you know, mm. sort of odd. Doesn't know um, his own strength kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, so she's been warned about that, but she's scared, she runs away, she, and then she finds the dog that they've adopted during this these few mm. weeks on the road, uh, you know, gutted and hanging from a tree. Yeah. Um, And, you know, that seems a little uh, gratuitous or something. Um. Like, again, why have you not noticed the dog is missing? Because they um, don't care. You, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're horrible to the dog. And then uh, she runs back to the house and, you know, sort of like the, the aunt goes out with a shotgun and sort of, you know, Max goes out to defend and everything. All right, everything's fine. And then she's like, oh, my kid. <laughs> yeah. She's clearly never thought about him before. <laughs> like, if I ran nope. back to a house and I even knew there was a kid on the premises, I'd be like, you know, secure, where is the kid? The very first thing I would think of. She what? is indeed she a terrible out. parent. Yeah, there's there's a problem here. No, I agree. I I thought the same thing. She and because it could <laughs> the the cut the scene it cuts to is it makes it even better because she does she's run back to the house and she's like oh my god and she says about the child. It then just cuts to a towel or a blanket that's been laid on the floor and you're just like, mm. oh, you haven't thought about this kid at all. Since that point. So the fact that like when Toe Cutter, um, you find that Toe Cutter's got this kid, there's a part of me going, yeah, he would possibly be part of a cult, but this he might get raised better in this bang, <laughs> this gang of mad bikers than actually with Max and his girlfriend. Well, you know, the thing you have to understand is it's Australia. And yeah. unless your four-year-old kid has tangled with a snake or a spider the size of his head, you know, He's just not uh, growing up properly. You know, that's, right. that's just something you have to do. That's right. Yeah. You get you have to go through the dingo challenge before you're six <laughs> in order to survive. Um, no, I know what you mean. This whole thing of the, with the family um, is it's just weird. Like it, the fact that it turns into this sort of attack on them as well and on, on mm-hmm. the, you know, um, we haven't seen there's no because there's no link that we're really aware of, and the biker gang isn't really aware of a link between Max and the Night Rider being killed off or anything like that. There's no sort of like drawback mm-hmm. to be like, oh, he's the one that killed the Night Rider, which is what I was expecting, mm-hmm. and it never comes. And I was like, oh, that's weird. I sort of assumed that they know, but you're right. There's it's it's never stated. No, right? I mean you know they're really upset. They keep saying like for Night Rider as they're attacking Max, but it seems totally coincidental. 
<laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I, I, I literally skipped back and I was like, I must have missed a drop line where someone tells them. I'm like, I don't know if yeah, that's right. the case. Um, so you have to sort of make that assumption that, that that's there. And so they sort of take out the, um, they take out the wife and the child or the girlfriend of the child. And th- this is what I have to say this again, it, this made me chuckle. Like, you know, it's not supposed to, um, but it's one of those things that's kind of lazy but silly. They cut to another hospital scene, and the what the, the girlfriend's in a, in a hospital bed, and you have this sort of collect, these two doctors and, and, and a nurse or whatever. There's a collection of medical staff, and then they start talking about her um, diagnosis, like what or prognosis, all, her like, injuries. all the injuries she's had, and it's yeah. like a laundry list of things. And I'm like, she was knocked down by like one, maybe two bikes. Like I get that the kids killed because that's you know children of that age, very young child, they're soft and they go squish and, and it's fine. Like that, I understand that, but the, the list of like you know injuries, <laughs> internal injuries. I'm like, was she hit by a truck? Like this kind yeah, of feels not... a little bit over the top. And Max what is there. What did they going, do? Oh. I don't know. What do they do on those bikes? Like, you know, I understand. They, well, they hit her once. All they do, they all her. you see is they run and you just hear her. It's they run almost, her down. They run her down right. and they do, the, they do the pet cemetery thing, which has never been done well, is we need to show that they've been hit by something and need to show it's traumatic. So we're going to throw a child's shoe through the air, <laughs> which never looks good because it always looks kind of comedic. And then we're going to throw a little ball as well. And you're like, oh, so mm. they've been killed. But... No one's come off the bike. No one's sort of wobbling. Or They've just carried on driving. So I'm like, mm-hmm. did they hit her? Did they do this? Whatever. They didn't stop. So it's not, and they didn't gun her, they didn't gun her down. So no, she's got a laundry list. that they kind of accelerated and gunned her down, you know, and, and, ex- Run and, her over. And, and like hit her directly. But yeah, I mean, like, then you see the injuries and it's like, oh, did you have like a clothesline between two bikes <laughs> or something? Like, like, but that's clearly not the case. It, it is a little strange. Yeah. So then they have, yeah, then Max is, then they say so that he's been stood there like yeah, a zombie all day. He's pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. He's been standing there all day, which is great because it allows Mel Gibson not to act. Yeah. Just, they're just like, stand at the doorway and look pissed off. That's yeah. All you have to do. Yeah. And then it, it cuts to a scene <laughs> of him sat on a, like overlooking the sea and he's in, like, you know, they're trying to show what I would see is, and uh, well, I'll, let me come round to it. He's sitting on this bed and he has this rubber mask that was used as a bit of a joke early in the film. And I'm like, it's supposed to be a callback to when they had fun between him and his girlfriend. I'm like, yeah, but it's a stupid mask. Like, this is really a bad callback. Um, and but I, there's a moment where I understand that frustration, that like pent up, like I can't just sit here. I've got, I've got energy and I've got to do something. And it's sort of built up. However, and you may disagree with this, Ma- Ma- Mel Gibson's acting definitely gets better. Because all I could think about whilst I was watching this is the scene um, relatively early on in Lethal Weapon mm. where he's playing Martin Riggs and you find out that like his wife had died in a car crash and he's been suicidal and he's in his in his uh, caravan trailer thing on the beach and he's sort of got that bullet and he's putting the bullet in his gun and there's a whole sort of like almost suicide scene in that. And oh, yeah. that's, that's almost heartbreaking. And I'm thinking... That's in 87. Like you've got, you know, eight years. And in that yeah. time, you're going to become a much better actor. So that's good to know. Yeah, I um, agree. No, I agree with that. And I kept thinking about Lethal Weapon because, especially in the first few Lethal Weapons, you know, that there are a lot of long shots of sort of like him on the beach yeah. being melancholy. <laughs> yeah. and, and those are clearly influenced by him at this kind of house. Yes. Looking at the ocean being melancholy. You know? Yeah. What Mel, what are you good at? Well, I can stand there and I can look at the sea. All right, brilliant. Three scenes of that then, please. Um We're, I'm gonna make you a star. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so it did make me think of that, and you know, there, there is that thing. but it's in then taking to the road. And this keeps wanting to do things that are there's that western the western tropes mm. or there are things. Because he opens the trunk and his police gear is in there, right? Mm-hmm. His leathers are in there and all sort of the stuff. But we've never had that scene of him saying, "I'm done. This is gone." Mm-hmm. You know, it's implied, but there's never that mm-hmm. sort of scene of him going, "I'm done," and locking the case and be like, "Put it in the attic," or like, 
you know, even opening this should be a trauma or someone saying that's not the answer. Like it just sort of happens. And then that's it. It's all very straightforward. Um, and then he's back on the road and he goes and gets the interceptor, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it's very perfunctory. That's the thing I would say about this. And I understand mm-hmm. that it's very cheap, but this, there's, there's so much sort of like perfunctory stuff of like, we've talked about this before of why did this happen? And why did this happen? Like, you know, and this definitely suffers from that. And then this happens. And then this happens. Mm-hmm. And then this happens. So like, decisions are made. But I'm like, I don't understand like why he's alone. Why is this happening and that happening? Like, you know, you've literally had the this this aunt character. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, br- what happens to her? Bring her in. Like, have her grieving right. and have her there. Like, she should stop Max or encourage him. Like, I don't know. She sounds like the kind of woman that would be like, get off your ass. The world's gone to shit. Go and get them. Well, and I'm going to help you, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to stand at a key point with a shotgun and you lure him there and I'm going to blow his head off, you know, yeah. so that sounds like, you know, but then it's just kind of dropped mm. and no, you're right. I mean, he never really like resigns from the force. I mean, there's a, you know, and I think that this kind of becomes a strength uh, in, the, in the franchise as it goes on, this mm-hmm. sort of like minimal plot and sort of characters suggesting things without actually saying that right that becomes this sort of minimalism um of dialogue of of plot but here it's a little wonky yes. um and even in the final confrontation you have these radio broadcasts where it's like you know uh, a member of the force has has got used excessive force <laughs> like who dialed that in <laughs> like yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know clearly you yeah. know it's him right like, yeah yeah it, they were like, why did you include that and not telegraph basic elements of the plot, right? Like what happened to the ant, you know? It was important <laughs> yeah, to you. There's, that... there's, there's kind of like the minutia is there, but actually the main milestone plot <laughs> developments <laughs> kind of dropped, you know? Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit backwards in that way. Um, but I do like that he goes back and, that you know, um, Chekhov's interceptor that was obviously discussed at the start of the mm-hmm. film when they're like, you know, we've actually got this cool car that's got the it's the last of the V8s, Max, the last of the V8s. Um, and yeah, he goes off and gets that, and it's a good looking car. Uh, and yeah, that's that's it. I mean, that's it really. The end of it is him then chasing down, and he has the thing on the bridge, they break his arm, shoot his knee out. I like the fact he gets injured, it's not straightforward. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. like he's kind of fucked up by the whole thing. Um, you know, well, and the the hacksaw, you know, mm, there mm. might be time to to cut. That's a classic, you know. I mean, like it's like, oh, okay, right? You know, I I forgot this is sort of the origin of that as yeah. a you know as a climax. Um, what you said about him getting fucked up, you know, I mean, like he's shot in the knee, and like I I will, you know, I will say, uh, you know, one of the things Mel Gibson does really well is limp. Like yeah. he is really good at like struggling to get to his feet, and I'm like, oh, you you let your main character, your action hero, get fucked up in a way that really prefigures Die Hard. Yes, um, you know, and that is something that continues in the series, um, and is something that really sets this apart. Um, but yes, you know, here that again, in retrospect, if this were all we had, we'd be like, that is a good element in an otherwise eh, you know, uh, a movie. Yeah. No, I agree. It's, it's um, yes, but it, it does work. Again, like you say, him sort of like mm-hmm. limping and hobbling and sort of, but even the fact he keeps his legs straight, like it gets bandaged up for the final bit. Like, you know, they, they stick to it, like from a continuity point of view. And that ending, yeah, where he finds the guy and he handcuffs him to the, the crashed car. That he's, that, that he's clearly crashed and he's stealing another guy's boots. Like they've moved on. And, um, yeah, he handcuffs him to it, and he, like, you know, he sets it up. Doesn't he? the petrol's falling into a lot into a, um, a broken headlight, and it it will start to drip out, and there's a lighter ready to go. And he's like, you know, take your fight, take your ten minutes to cut through tensile the tensile steel of the handcuffs, five minutes to cut through your ankle. Um, so I like that. And Max is like, Max isn't going to shoot him. He's killing that. No, no, I'm giving you a chance. Like you know, and then and then leaves, and then that's the end. I mean, it's it's sort of like you know. Um, disappears complete. In, yeah, disappears into the wastelands. Yeah, I, and of course, it also recalls the way Goose was killed. Um, mm. you know, with 
his overturned car and the gasoline. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah. It does need to be said, gasoline doesn't work this way. <laughs> I mean, this, no. is, this is one of those movies that helps establish, like, gasoline is really basically lighter fluid. Yeah. Um, which it is not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, okay, I'm I'm not sure that he really has either five or ten minutes. Uh, you know, based, on, but it doesn't really matter, right? Because yeah. Max is kind of a dick, and, you know, and so it, it doesn't really matter. The whole point is to traumatize this guy further by forcing him to make the decision. Mm. Um, so yeah, no, I dig, I dig that. It and again, that's the sort of like bleakness that we're going to really appreciate about the series, mm. but that here is just kind of like a bleak, interesting, you know, um, low budget Australian movie with some major flaws, but some major sort of idiosyncratic good stuff, you know? Um, no, I agree. I think then that's sort of been the summation, isn't it? That that's what this is. Like you know, the germs of ideas. And I think, you know, just to cover off some of the others is there's a moment when they're stealing gasoline from a tanker truck. And that is so reminiscent of things we're going to see in the future. Like, there's two guys, they slow it down by having a slow bike in front of it. A guy pole vaults onto the top of it. Two other guys sort of jump onto the back of it and are sort of, you know, um, siphoning out the gasoline from the top of this truck. And, and there's so many of the bits like that. At the, the end, when um, with the, sort of like the chicken and you've, you know, after I've scared him off, and then the, the truck plows through and kills. Um, uh, toe cutter and all that sort of stuff like you know it's the stunts and the stuff is there and you're going oh that's that's the stuff they want to do but they kind of felt they had to wrap it around this melodrama um but you, as you say the sort of the the crumbs of what is to come is there one of the things i wanted to highlight and i, I watching these the working through these this time and going back i'm going to put this out as a bit of a and i'm going to be cautious how i do this into whether it's positive or negative i don't know but there's a queer element to this film mm -hmm. that I was oh, like, yeah. you know, and it's, 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 you know, you've said about the, the, their lead cop is called Fifi and he's this big sort of burly guy, a big handlebar moustache. He's in leathers, walks around his, with his shirt off and a, like a, a, a silk scarf around his neck. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, the relationship between toe cutter and Johnny, the boy, you know, Johnny, the boy is the pretty one. There's that sort of thing. And so I'm like, okay, it's all there's there's elements of potentially sort of innuendo about it there, and it's all fine. However, there's a moment they they there's two people, a young couple, try to escape the town. They've got this sort of like flame red and yellow and orange uh, dragster, and they run off. They run off, and they almost run down Toe mm. Cutter, and so they mm -hmm. chase them down and stuff, and they make their car crash, and they smash the car up with like um poles and axes and bats and all this other stuff. It's kind of graphic. It's kind of a crazy, and that's again a germ of what's well, going to come in the future. And they clearly have gang-raped the girl. <sighs> oh, this is what I'm saying. Well, yeah. the thing is, they've, they've clearly gang-raped this girl, and, but she's she, when they find her, they have her underwear. She has her underwear on. But that's I think that's going to be a film thing where they're like, yeah. right, you know, they've, they've got to show things. However, the guy, at one point, Max and Goose come across him running across the field, and mm -hmm. he does not have any underwear on. Mm-hmm. And I, the implication is that he's also been gang raped, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the, that was this. Watching this, I was like, oh, yeah. "Oh, I've never taken that hint before. I've never thought that. I've just gone like, oh, naked guy.' This was the one. I was like, oh, oh, like this is this like there's some severe sexual violence in this film, not on oh, screen. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. And this is not. I mean, all of the movies are going to have severe sexual violence in one way or another. Let's yeah. be crystal clear. Um. Yeah, I mean, that is something that definitely posed me to, like, it's it's very ca casual about. It, it, well, they call know, him like, a dickhead. They basically, they basically, they call, like, the guys running across the field, and they're like, dickhead. Like, there's no, like, oh, that guy's in trouble. He's a fucking rapist. <laughs> no, like, no, no, the guy who's been. He's a victim, yeah. The victim. The victim's running yeah. across the field, and Goose and Max are a bit like, dickhead. Like, there's no sort of, like, right. oh, my God, like, what's happened to yeah. him? Yeah. There's no, there's no care until they come across the the woman and Goose is like, oh, well, we've got to get her out of here. Well, and then and then is is it? Uh, it's another gang member who they find by the car. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, so and he's the one they arrest. That's when they arrest him. And yeah, um, and he's bailed out by the lawyers basically. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's that. that's the one Johnny the boy was supposed to go back and get. So 
yeah, no, that guy is traumatized for life. Um, mm. you know, and yeah, I I felt very strange about that too. I mean, I think that the gang rape is sort of a product of um this sort of like new brutal world. I mean, look, there's rape in Clockwork Orange too. Mm-hmm. Oh um, god, yeah, yeah. And as these movies go on and society collapses, clearly there is a perception of women's rights and equality uh, as basically something that is made possible by a a Marxist capitalist surplus, right? Which is not wrong historically, right? Like women, you know, you know, one of my pet peeves is like, you know, uh, projecting present values on the past, right? And it's like, right. Well, you know, when you, when the average family has four kids and half of them are going to die, um, and it takes a lot of time to run a house, you know, somebody mm. stays home to do that. When you have dishwashers, it gets a lot easier. <laughs> you know, there <laughs> there are just some, some basic technological capitalist reasons for this. In, in present cities, it's a lot easier to imagine, well, why don't they in the Sudan have equality of the genders? Mm. Uh, you know, that's not been a, a, a big trait in human history. And so you can see the commodification of of women, uh, obviously, you know, going starting in this world. Yeah. Um, the homosexual thing, you know, Fifi's clearly, you know, a gay character. Yeah. Um, and and he is, you know, one thing that I like about that depiction is that he's coming from a forgotten chapter of gay history. That he's mm. coming from that sort of like. Uh, muscle bike, leather wearing, you know, uh, uh, 1970s. What? Cruising. cruising. Yeah, the film yeah. Cruising. Um, yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah. And and that's all been paved over mm-hmm. by the, uh, you know, the, the gay lobby groups really mm-hmm. starting in the 90s that really wanted to present homosexuality as just like heterosexuality. And so, you know, suddenly every depiction of of gay people became, you know, committed relationships. And and that is ultimately the course that won gay marriage and won, you know, civil rights and all of these things. And I'm glad those rights occurred. Right. But I do think that there's been an edginess to, you know, homosexuality and to alternate sexuality that's been lost. And mm. Fifi clearly represents that earlier stage of mm. uh, homosexual depictions, including in the gay community, where, you know, uh, homosexuality was something a little different, a little, you know, um, outside of the mainstream, not just a clone of heterosexuality with, you know, two men or two women. No. Um, it was allowed to be a little different. So I do kind of dig that. I do think there's a kind of repressed homosexual reading where clearly, like, Max is in love with Goose, okay? Oh, He's abandoning 100%. the girl. He's yes. going to the police station. They are fucking against those cops, okay? Yeah. You know, in my, in my, in my like, uh, uh, headcanon, you know, this is what's happening, right? But they can't do that, right? Mm. So Goose has to die, and also the duplicate, you know, heterosexual relationship has to die for him to finally yeah. go into full revenge mode. Yes. Um, but I agree with you. There's definitely a lot of sexual politics and stuff going on here. But it's weird that, like you say, because Fifi, I say, is, is as you I agree, is, um, you know, this homosexual character, this gay character. It's never it's never stated. It's, it's like it's more mm-hmm. that it's implied just from his sort of design. But again, it's sort of he and it, but it's never an issue. Like he's the head of the police yep. force. He's probably one of the, him and Max are the most competent ones there. Mm-hmm. Everyone respects him. And like, even when he like Max quits, like he's like, you know, basically like, well, we'll be here when you come back, boy. You know, sort of there's that kind of like, you know, he is the grizzled character that Max should be. Um, that like he's seen some shit and he's like, yeah, no, well, you know, I know you can't give this up. Um, and even that's the relationship between like Toe Cutter and Johnny the Boy, which I think we are going to sort of like say you, we are well, we're definitely going to see in Road Warrior. Um, these these gay characters, it's kind of despite them being the villains, and obviously there's the the obviously the sexual violence against those those let's say civilian victims. 
there is kind of like there's a weird kind of like there's a relationship going on within the gang, but it's mm-hmm. it's never like decried as why they're weird. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, that's not the point. That's not why they're weird. It's just part and parcel of this thing of this group of men that travel around the outback. Like it's almost like, well, of course that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, no, there's a kind of like acceptance of it. Yeah. Um, and I think that acceptance is very positive. Um, but then there's, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to ding that, but, but at the same time, you know, uh, there, it is kind of like tied to this brutality. Um, I agree. Way, right? Yeah. That's the difficulty. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where it's like in a world that's falling apart, you know, the gay a, a gay man will be your police <laughs> captain, and everyone will be forced to wear leather and atlas, assless chaps as yeah. officers of the law, and you know, <laughs> and roving gangs will rape women and men. <laughs> yeah, <know? laughs> like, like yeah, not, you know, not quite sure it's as progressive as you think it is. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I know what you say. I understand what you say, and that's the problem. I think, like, I'm saying, you know. It's not as progressive as, as I, you know, I'm not saying it's progressive, but I was kind of like, oh, as you said, you know, this is a, a small, night, late 70s revenge, outback yeah. revenge flick. But I'm like, but they've but they've put that in there and it seems, and it will. I mean, I don't even know. I'm not even sure. Is George Miller gay? Because it crossed my mind. I don't know. I have no idea. I've never Googled it. But like, it's just, it's something that crossed my mind. I was like, oh, like, you know, this seems like, why wouldn't he put sort of these characters in there? But anyway. I'm sure this will come yeah. up. I'm say I'm sure it will definitely come up because we're going to talk about Road Warrior next. Um, so uh, I mean, George Miller's been married to uh, multiple women. I okay, I've never Fair heard. Play. You know, okay, um, I didn't know. I didn't know that. I, I've never really looked into to his personal life. So, okay, that makes sense. Anyway, anyway, so let's let's what we're coming to. Well, there's, there's not a great. There's any other final points to make about my final thought is Fifi is yet another character who uh, illustrates another sort of germ of things that are i'm going to love in the series but that aren't quite here yet Mm -hmm. which is like the lack of explanation of secondary characters and situations that make you want like side stories you know where it's like everything in this universe is going to like beg for weird side stories about it i want the fifi you know, sprinkle cool comics like you know, the, Mad Max the... Origins colon Fifi. You yeah. know, like I want that movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I agree. Like, yeah, what was you know? Because well, this, it's bit. Let me put it this way. So the guy that wrote this, I'm, I, I keep saying the guy that wrote this, right? Um, James. Uh, here you go. So George Miller's on there, but uh, James um, McCausland, I think it's him, and also because I think I'll see who wrote Mad Max. Uh, Road Warrior. He basically came up. Um, oh no, it's the guy from the second one, Terry Hayes. So it's Terry Hayes who, who wrote the second one. He came mm-hmm. up with a whole bunch of backstories for all these characters from both the first oh, and yeah. second films. So like they were never used, but he was like, "Oh no, that's totally what happened. That's how this world went." And one of them is Fifi, and Fifi was a cop before the fall. So he is the mm-hmm. only one. That is officially like was it officially like a police officer and other stuff. So there is that thing where, like you say, Mad Max Origins, <laughs> colon Fifi. Yeah. Um, I I think I'm all for that now, to be honest, or at least a, like a a prequel comic. I want the pre yeah. I want the Toka to prequel comic. I want the Fifi prequel comic. Um, you know that's but there needs to really. be like a Mad Max anthology TV show with a <laughs> with a Fifi episode. You know? yeah. <laughs> like that's that's it. Yes, uh, a prestige Mad Max reboot that that has that uh, in there. Um, anyway, so that's yeah. I think you're right. I think the, the final point for this is that Mad Max is the germ of an idea on a string, a shoestring budget, and um, it, it, like you say, if it wasn't continued, would probably be down as a sort of a footnote in cinema history for some of the ideas. Um, and has some great ideas in there and some silly performances as well as silly stunts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, but it's the the next film in the series. I think that really throws those fireworks in the air and is like, look at us over here. Um, but yeah, but anyway, so that's, that's it for Mad Max. I think you're right. We're going to start this Mad Max. Before we do, 
let's you know we are going to continue our saga but we've got more to tell you let's give this could, could can we give the audience a bit of a taste a snippet uh, a glimpse if you will of some of the films just not all but some of the films we are going to cover in the um forthcoming season well i i have the list of uh stuff we've agreed on um you know one uh one that coming to mind as we were talking about you know mad max and i was anticipating this was tank girl yeah yeah because that is like almost in the mad max universe yes (laughs) um uh you know the the omega man uh you know a a boy and his dog uh you know uh, postman Oh, mm. I mean, everybody's going to tune in for the postman. I, We've we done just water. Sold to, we did Waterworld. We have to do the postman. <laughs> right? If Kevin Costner is going to make an overlong, <laughs> self-serious post-apocalypse film, we have to watch it. So, yes, mm. I'm kind of looking forward to the postman because I've never seen it, and it's it's um, it, I know it's going to be long. So, yeah. So we've got some good films. We've got some interesting films coming up. Tank Girl in particular, I'm very excited for because I'm look- I am looking mm. forward to that. Which goes I to another- seen that in years. No, which goes to another conversation we were just having about we were having before we came on it about how the '90s were really throwing out very different kinds of comic book based films, and that's a really good example of trying for something different. So um, yeah, Laurie Petty and and um, and shooting some- for the fences, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. really and, and, swinging. And- it really prefigures, you know, like the uh, sort of like rude, not girly, put together female action hero. You know, yes, it doesn't have to be a supermodel, you know, with Mm-mm. perfect makeup, um, who's kicking ass too, like Black Widow or something. You know, um, no, the, you know, and uh, and of course, like the... and and LL Cool J dressed as a kangaroo. So, you know, yeah, a bit of everything for everyone there. What more can you want? Exactly. Um, so yes, so that's what we've got. But of course, if you like that, stick around. There's going to be so much more. We're still going to continue our Mad Max saga. But that's not all. We've obviously just covered Black Mirror, and we've had multiple series. This is going to be season five um, of the show. So go back and check apocalypse. our apocalypse. Previous... <laughs> this is the apocalypse episode. Um, so go <laughs> check in back in the other seasons that we've done, and we've covered a whole bunch of other films. Um, and those early ones, just to say, uh, you know, they're on the main feed now. But you know, it may not be forever because you know we want to keep them in, available. But they'll be available in different formats in the near future. So go check them out if you want them. But there's also on the Patreon, trekking through the Twilight Zone. We are going through all of the Twilight Zone. We're into season five now, um, and so we'll be moving on to well, other things soon. Tons of stuff on the Patreon, and mm. a whole like third of the season that we've got planned as Patreon exclusives. Mm-hmm. You know, to go along with uh, Apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you yeah. you uh, want the whole films. thing. You know, there there's a bunch that's going to be uh, on Patreon. That's it, and I think you'll find that that's one of the things we've done quite so. As you say, a lot of times we've gone out and done, you know, side things for other films, short films, mm-hmm. associated films. So there's loads of stuff on the Patreon. Go check out links down below. But for now, I will say, Julian, thanks for joining me on this uh, this quest, this road, this road uh, journey. Uh, as we go through the wastelands. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next episode.